growing up into your adult life with the Urantia revelation um, and maturing with it, with the teachings, with the controversies, <laughs> with the community. And we have a couple of um, wonderful folks. And I'm also part of this panel. I'm a veteran Urantia book reader, but I'll be the moderator. And uh, we're going to begin with uh, Elizabeth Engstrom Craddy, who is here from Oregon. She's um, a well-known novelist and has become a minister now of sorts, an independent minister like many Urantians. I met her at the Maui Writers Conference 16 years ago. I haven't seen her since, and so pleased to have her here. She was co-running the major conference for writers back then. And uh, there's a lot more to say about Liz, but uh, you can read it in uh, the program. So Liz, I'm going to turn this over to you to just, just talk to us about what it's like to have the Arantia book in your life for years and decades. To welcome all of you here, and to welcome all of our unseen friends who are here. <coughs> Think of all the guardian angels that must be present in this room. Someone once told me that um, the angels are busy, they've got lots of stuff to do, and it's like you working in your office and your kids are playing in the other room, and you get an ear out, and you're listening, and everything's quiet, and everything seems good. And when they're doing something that's of importance, then you kind of peek into the room, make sure everything is good in there, and that's how the angels work. They just leave us to our own devices, but when we're doing something of spiritual import, they open the door and peek in, and make sure that everything is good. And I think they're all looking at us here today, and I'm delighted about that. So I'm here to talk to you about uh, the, what the Arantia book has done for my life. And um, it started in 1978 when I was struggling with alcoholism. I had a real problem with booze. And um, this is not my drunk log, but I was uh, struggling. I'd been trying to quit drinking, and for some reason, I could not. It was beyond me. I was powerless over alcohol. I also was, had a business partner, to, partner, Tonya Bainey. Many of you may have heard that name. She was um, executive director of the Arantia Foundation for some time. Anyway, on my birthday, Tonya took me out to luncheon, and we're having luncheon. It's a nice day, and we're on Maui, what's not to like? And she said, uh, do you believe in God? And I said, well, pff, of course. I mean, what do you think all this is, an accident? And she said, no, I mean, really. If God created a personality, what do you think those personality attributes would be? Well, I'd never thought about that before. I thought God, you know, but. And I said, well, I don't know. What do you think? And she said, well, truth, beauty, and goodness would be attributes of God's personality. And if we're to become better people, then we would want to emulate those uh, personality attributes. And I thought, well, I don't know, I don't understand how you would emulate truth, beauty, and goodness. And she said, by love, mercy, and ministry. Um, the absolute truth is love. If you want to portray beauty, then show mercy. And if you want to exemplify goodness, uh, then minister to your fellows. And then on the way home from that lunch, uh, she bought me, we stopped at the bookstore, she bought me a Urantia book, and I was off and running. But I still struggled with alcohol. For another two years, I um, tried to quit, quit drinking. In fact, I quit drinking every day and was drunk by noon. And then on July 31st, 1980, I hit my bottom. And man, it was bad. Oh, boy. Uh, uh, since this is not my drunk log, and this is not an AA meeting, <laughs> let me just tell you that it was bad. And I woke up the next morning, and I literally fell to my knees. And I was pounding on the bed, and I was saying, God, because we had started a study group, a Urantia book study group, and I was into it, even though I was drinking. Why can't I stop drinking? You know, I'm, I'm beseeching God. And I heard a voice. I heard a voice. It was not in my head. 
it was right next to my ear, it was female, it was lips right next to my ear. And this voice said, just don't drink. And I'll tell you that, as odd as that may sound, that was a total revelation to me. I always thought I had to quit drinking. You know, I was a little screwed up in the head. Not only did I have to quit drinking, but I probably, if I was going to quit drinking, I should probably quit smoking and lose 20 pounds. But just to not drink meant that I didn't have to change my whole life. I, all my friends drank. I didn't know what to do without that. Just don't drink was amazing to me. Um, and I haven't had a drink since. Uh, I threw myself, I found an AA meeting, I threw myself into it because I thought, I've been given a little gift here, I best not just let it go or take it for granted. So I threw myself into AA to heal that alcohol part of me. And in my study group, we'd been, we'd been reading around in the, in the book, in the Urantia book for a couple of years. I said, you know what, let's get serious about this study group. Let's start on page one, and let's really study the book. And we did, and it took us 13 years to get from the first page to the last. But I'll tell you, we studied that book. Sometimes we didn't get further than a paragraph. And I got such a foundation between the two of spirituality and knowledge of God in my life that it totally, over the years, transformed me. Now, an alcoholic woman is filled with shame. You know, there are things that I did, and the way that I behaved uh, still, still, there are places I don't want to go. Because even though I have made my amends, and I have transformed my life, that shame still hangs out with me. But now I know about grace. And I know about God's love for me. And I know that, you know, you hear, in, you hear in grade school, Jesus loves you. Ah, yeah, so God loves me, big deal. But you know what? I know today that God likes me. God depends on me. You know, my children, when they were little, even today, now that they're adults, they say things that just delight me. They're so <coughs> weird, my kids. I just love them. And I know that God looks at me in that same way. I do things that nobody else does. I say things, I think things in a way that nobody else does. And God delights in me in that way. That's why he is the ultimate father. And that is why one of our requirements is the parental experience. I understand that that love for my children, and God loves me in the same way. He loves me, he likes me, he delights in me, and I can, I can let my shame go because I know that all is forgiven. And that is a healing of amazing proportions. So what has the Urantia book done for me? The Urantia book has, uh, has given me time. It's let me know that I don't need to get it right. Not now, not, I've got billions of years to get it right. I don't, certainly don't have to do it in 70, 80, 90 short years. I am stumbling around. I'm trying to figure it out. I make lots of mistakes. But Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. One, love one another as, as the Father loves you. I should look at people with a father's love. And let me tell you, that's a, that's a tall order. There are some really annoying people. And sometimes I'm one of them. And, um, and I don't like that in myself. I don't admire that in myself. But, it, but it's true. And then, so I'm reading the Urantia book, and we come to the healing at sundown. Do you uh, remember that, uh, that part about the healing at sundown where Jesus spontaneously healed a thousand people? Well, that really resonated with me because I've had such an amazing healing. And yet, 
most of those people um, were changed by their experience. They, they, they came to Jesus as uh, crippled and blind and, 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 and they received this great healing and, and then nothing changed in them. And that made me cry when I read that passage because I thought that is just, that was such a waste. That was such a waste. And God's covenant with, or Abraham's covenant with, with Melchizedek, which Byron talked about, God agrees to do everything. We say that again. This is the great covenant between God and man. God agrees to do everything. Man agrees to believe and follow God's instructions. God agrees to do everything. Man agrees to believe and follow directions. And Jesus' direction to us is love one another as I have loved you. That's it. And if you will love, if I will love my fellow humans with a father's desperate love, then God will do everything. What is there to worry about? What's there to, what's there to fear? There's no fear. If I were to design my life, it would have been so safe and so boring and so mundane, but instead I've been given a life of amazing, amazing adventure. Okay. And more to come. Billions of years of more adventure to come. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Liz. You brought out a dimension that we needed to bring out this morning. I'm really glad you did. I've only read one of Liz's novels. I've read uh, Lizard Wine. It's a book about evil. And it's, it's, it's brought forward in a plot that I, I was, it was breathtaking. And it's the only book of yours I've read, but I can recommend her fiction. Um, we now have a very special guest. His name is Professor Jeff, Jeffrey Waddles. He's going to come in by Skype if we can make it work. Be patient with us. And Jeff is, uh, you can cue him up. Uh, Jeff has spent his adult life as a scholar um, of philosophy and theology and ethics. Uh, he has a major book uh, on the Golden Rule, and it's considered one of the best academic books on the Golden Rule. There was recently a whole conference about his book. Um, it's called Golden Rule. Jeff teaches at Kent State University. He's emeritus professor of philosophy there. And his new book is on, um, it's uh, called A New Philosophy of Living. The Wrench Book advocates that each of us, <clears throat> <laughs> that each of us develop a philosophy of living. So it's philosophic spirituality, as we discussed earlier. And the philosophy of living can be built around the core values, the core values of truth, beauty, and goodness. So Jeff is going to speak to us about it. Thank you very much, Byron. Beloved brother Byron, um, I will read first a quotation that the Arantia book attributes to Jesus. Consider the Greeks who have a science without religion. Well, the Jews have a religion without science. And when men become thus misled into accepting a narrow and confused disintegration of truth, their only hope of salvation is to become truth-coordinated, converted. Let me emphatically state this eternal truth. If you, by truth coordination, learn to exemplify in your lives this beautiful wholeness of righteousness, your fellow men will then seek after you that they may gain what you have so acquired. Now, let me restate the main message here. Number one. If you learn to coordinate science and spirituality in your way of living, 
then, too, you will achieve a beautiful wholeness of righteousness. And as a result, three, people will be attracted to seek after you so that they may gain what you have so acquired. Now, this truth-coordinated living is the first part of a philosophy of living in truth, beauty, and goodness. And I'm going to summarize that part with an emphasis on aspects of spiritual living. And the spiritual living, as I'm going to set it forth, is interconnected with philosophical and spiritual living. So I'm going to talk about philosophy of participating in evolution on four levels, cosmological, biological, psychological, and historical. All right, this is a very brief survey, so hang in there. The cosmological participation is to adopt an attitude, to choose an attitude, to choose to regard this universe as friendly. Here's a quotation, again from the Arantia book, that attributes to Jesus the following statement. I am absolutely assured that the entire universe is friendly to me. This all-powerful truth, I insist on believing with a wholehearted trust in spite of all appearances to the contrary. Now, if we take up um, the, the project of the scientific living and truth-coordinated living and living affirmatively, and we ask scientific cosmology, is it a friendly universe? Well, or if we just ask ourselves when some tornado has swept through, is it a friendly universe? We're going to hear stories of that which seems hostile or neutral. So it takes a faith perspective to talk about friendly universe. And uh, I want to say, concluding this segment of my sharing with you, that we can talk about the universe as being friendly in the following ways. First of all, the universe is comparatively understandable, and it's work withable, and it supports our quest for truth and beauty and goodness, and it gives us the prospect of a friendlier world if we choose to cooperate, and it allows us to believe in a friend we cannot see and a destiny we cannot prove. Okay, that was cosmological living. Um, the quick overview. Now to biology, which will be even quicker. Oh, well, let's see. I was going to tell you a cosmological story. We'll see how our time goes for that. Uh, Jeff, we've got, I'd say, seven minutes. Seven minutes. Seven more minutes. <laughs> Will that work? We can give you more. Seven in the... sweet minutes. Yes. We will take the three, it's... the first three for meditation. <laughs> well, I prune my ambition. <laughs> All right. Biological living is healthy living, uh, holistically healthy living. And we care for our own health as that of others and that of our ecosystem. There's another aspect to this. Neuroscience is telling us so much about ourselves, about including the biology of religious and spiritual experience. And so we, we may really wonder what's coming, um, you know, what's going on with all this neuroscience apparent explanation of all things. And I wish to suggest to you 
that in any sincere effort to reach out to our universal father, there's some, what's my phrase? There's the spiritual domain of the reality of religious experience. That's a phrase that I take again from the Arantia book, uh, Classical Pagination 192, Paper 16, Section 6, da 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 da, Cosmic Mind. But the idea that in religious experience there's a spiritual domain of the reality of it, how comforting! But there's also a periphery, and that periphery is going to be um, biochemical this is and that's that are extraneous to the spiritual core and mental goings on that are extraneous. And as we evolve, the proportion of the outside to the core diminishes. Next, psychological uh, experience. Here I'm involved in um, transplanting some great ideas of Sigmund Freud into the garden of a spiritual philosophy of living. Uh, Sigmund Freud made the discovery that the child, uh, that the father is the child's first image of God in the typical case. And without going into any detail, I just wish to say, well, we can accept that discovery, but also see that first image of God as the divinely created scaffolding for a spiritually mature relation to God that leaves the childhood images behind. Second, Freud took on critically the idea of love your neighbor as yourself. He gave many cautions, and those many cautions can be transplanted into wise uh, pointers for um, loving the neighbor. Here are six pointers transplanting Freud into the garden of a spiritual philosophy of living. One, you need to receive love if you want to give love. Number two, maintain self-respect. Number three, do not become emotionally involved in the life of every person you meet. Four, do not neglect your duties as family member, friend, coworker, neighbor, and citizen. Five, I don't know my numbering here. With strangers, let trust grow gradually. Next. Remember that what you can reasonably expect of yourself is less than your ideal of perfection. And last, develop a psychologically sound technique for acknowledging and rechanneling your own aggression. <laughs> the last uh, image that I will give you is the uh, participation in history, world history. And we do that by working for a planetary spiritual renaissance to make this world a better place in whatever way we can. As a parent, as a worker, as a, you know, with our spare time, we do what we can in that way. And I wish to leave you um, with this image of history as a, mar as a decathlon. That's the 10 event Olympic, you've got 10, right, 10 events, a decathlon. And in any one event, you've got the forces of love and the forces of destruction competing. And in any historical generation, it is uncertain which of those forces is going to prevail. But as far as the decathlon as a whole is concerned, the outcome, brothers and sisters, is not in doubt. <laughs> I think I'm out of time. <laughs>
<laughs> if Byron wants to ask any question to, or, or just say thank you very much, uh, it's lovely to, to be seen and to see Byron. And I'm very grateful. I, I, I know you're having a wonderful conference. Please continue to do so. Well, Jeff, uh, thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat>